You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Hello, everybody. What a day it has been, or a couple days it's been. Amazing audio released in this case from Charlie Adelson's jail to Donna Adelson. I don't know what is more amazing. Every time I hear one clip or the next, every time I think this is the most amazing audio clip I've ever heard, another one comes down the pike and my jaw hits the floor again couple things about these audio clips. They affirm everything that we were thinking about them as people. And it really made me think about this case in a new way. And here's, here's how. So the way that this case is described is that Dan Markell was killed mostly for the reason that The kids needed to be moved, and Wendy, the kids and Wendy needed to be moved to Miami. Then there's the side issue of Wendy possibly losing her law license for hiding assets in her divorce papers. And there's the added issue of Donna losing any kind of any kind of visit that's not supervised with her grandchildren. That's what Dan Markell was asking for. He said that he was a victim of parental alienation, and he was asking that all visits with his children and Donna be supervised. So what I hear when I hear these audio calls is I hear a family completely self-interested and selfish with with each person with their own agenda. So Harvey just loves getting revenge and doesn't want anyone to mess with the Adelson family. Donna wants the grandchildren in Miami so that she can parade around as grandmother of the year to all her friends for her own image. And Wendy of course, wants to protect herself. And so this is a family that won't even look after other members of the family. And Charlie, of course, has a chance to redeem himself as the black sheep, as the loser, as the one who can't do anything that needs help to graduate and get his dental license. With, from his parents, that he can do things. It's really funny. The Society page did videos with Charlie Adelson as Fredo, very appropriate. And now Donna's all mad because Wendy is t- doing exactly what Donna was about to do when she was going to take off to Vietnam with her husband and leave Charlie in prison, stranded alone in prison with basically no family to look after him. If you think Wendy's going to look after Charlie, you're kidding. And she's mad because Wendy's not tending to her needs. Other thing, it affirms what we had heard, the leaks that we heard, that the family was hyping themselves up. Donna was hyping Charlie up and saying everything's going to go great. Charlie was giving away his... Food in jail. We heard that from Bleed Fancy Fiction, like that. Let that out early. And that is all affirmed in these audio recordings. But what I didn't realize is how much Dan Rashbaum has become this Bengali to this family. It's Ask Dan this. Did you ask Dan that? Everything is Dan. Dan Rashbaum knew that they 
were planning to flee had advised them that they may be picked up in the airport. They just turned out to be Donna. <laughs> so she was aware that she might not get on that plane. I found that a little disappointing. I love the idea of her thinking she got away with everything <laughs> about to walk on that plane and then she gets arrested. But he was advising them what to do, how to protect themselves. And it cements my feeling that Dan is a kind of lawyer that I wouldn't think too highly of his moral morals. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's a little too comfortable working outside the confines of morality and the law. Great questions, uh, comments from you guys. From the last episode, Wendy Adelson, The Gift of Entitlement. Allie Marcus says, I love that Wendy has turned her back on them. Predictable as heck, and I'd expect nothing else, but the fact that Donna seemed shocked is hysterical. Wendy has been playing them from the time she convinced them Dan was the one abusing her. It was the other way around. They deserve exactly what they're getting. Very, my insights exactly. Wendy is a perfect product of this family. And you see how they treated the oldest son, Rob, who had some feeling for other people and a sense of morality. They just teased him mercilessly, couldn't understand him, treated him like an alien. Actually, before I get to that one, Lord's Girl 1123 says, the Cheerios comments means, look, I didn't try to clean my car since Danny was shot. It's not a crime scene. She refers to her children, quote, one kid is long and skinny and the other kid is sh short and chunky, unquote. In all the years I've raised my two sons, I never spoke about them as a kid. I might say one of the boys is short or one of my little guys is tall and skinny. It's just a weird way for a mom to refer to a child. And it's kind of disparaging. That stuck out to me too. Very odd. Everything out of her mouth is just like a little bit, not everything, but many things are a little bit off, a little bit contrary, very contrary to what we'd expect, or just a little makes you kind of raise an eyebrow. Little sus, I guess would be the word for that. Long comment here from Willie Meg's cover up. He manipulated, this is about Charlie, everyone around him, his house guest, Janice. So this is a call that came out and they referred to Janice and I'll show you a picture of her in a second as the housekeeper and Charlie's asking her to get rid of some of his adult love making accessories. I think that <laughs> may be the way. And, and he has like a whole chest of them and it kind of made me laugh because of course we've heard the tapes of one of his girlfriends saying, you're really unsatisfactory in that department. You just talk. <laughs> she said, I think you just stick it in and talk about yourself, go to town. So I guess he needs all the help he can get. But here's this convicted murderer worrying about his parents finding <laughs> his adult stuff in the closet and begging Janice, who looks like one of his many women, round of women, to throw everything away. Walker, so Janice, the dog walker, housekeeper escort, is delusional as 
Charlie's baby mama and is a perfect example of crazy finding crazy. She's asking about what he's going to do with his house, LOL. I'm sure she was after Charlie being 20 years older for his good looks. Charlie knocked up Dave, Wendy's boyfriend's nanny. I won't say her name, but it's easy to find. Basic white girl name fitting. This happened when June and him were on a break. Ouch. Then baby mama sues Charlie for being a deadbeat father. So Charlie would not, Charlie wouldn't even pay his own son's health insurance. You can look all this up on the AA Legal Focus YouTube page. Judy is the host. Great channel. I'm a big fan of that channel. Baby Mama said on Fancy Fiction's Instagram page that they have a great co-parent relationship, but she wanted to sue to get it all in writing. I don't really buy it. Why make your life messy by putting your business out there? Charlie even had to discuss his assets, income, wealth for his lawsuit. Judy from AA Legal Focus did a deep dive and has the docs. Some stuff redacted, like the address and name of child, but it's still all out there. Charlie is a trash father. Um, I'm, I'm going to like leave it there. <laughs> I think that's enough. I think that's enough attacking someone who wasn't involved in the crime and connected herself with a convicted murderer. I think that's punishment enough. But I think what the interesting point and why I picked that comment really is because, of course, he made sure Katie's children got their health insurance. <laughs> but his own child, you've got to sue for it. It's just really typical of the way he operates. The other thing I was really shocked at is how dumb Charlie is, how limited his vocab is, how unconvincing his arguments, how simplistic and illogical are his arguments. But let's get into it. Without further ado, let's get into one of these calls. This, of course, to start off with, I thought we'd start off with Charlie. Hold on. I thought we'd start off with the Donna possibly implicates Wendy call. I did not hear it the way other YouTubers heard it. I heard her say, I didn't say she was involved. And I think that it's, I think we can all have come to the conclusion that the phone, that the call kind of dropped in the middle, making it sound more damning than it really was. But if you listen through it's clear with the rest of what she says. So a lot of what they're saying is like as if they're in court making another argument for their innocence. That they Charlie was convicted with no evidence, that it was a Tallahassee witch hunt, the people in Tallahassee due to the high profile nature of the case couldn't be impartial, which is hilarious because he paid $1 million from for Josh Dubin, former Innocence Project ambassador. And you can look at the videos on my channel about my deep dive of six years into reading the transcripts and looking into the famous Innocence Project cases. See what I think about that. Not much. Spoiler alert. Not much. Sorry, I had to cough. But he paid $1 million for this jury consultant to basically berate the jury, gets half of the jury thrown out on the first day. Uses all sorts of really what I felt were sleazy tactics to try to convince them that they had to go into the deliberation room with the idea of innocence in mind. And he said, well, if it contradicts what the judge is going to instruct you, please forgive me. Like he doesn't know being a lawyer, Josh Dubin. A real, really creepy guy, in my opinion. 
And that's not enough. I mean, he has all these advantages and it's not enough. He's still going to complain about his trial because he thinks he was great on the stand. And I can't wait to go over those calls where he's saying he was personable and great. And Donna's like, and Dan was great. It's almost like Donna's in love with Dan Rashbaum. She thinks he can solve everything, do everything. And there's an interesting part. There's two interesting parts before I get into this call that I want to talk about. One where Donna talks about Charlie being on watch and being in kind of a solitary confinement situation. And she talks about it. She says, it's like you're it's like her deepest fear. She knows she's empty. She says, it's like you're looking into a chasm or a mirror of yourself. All you have is yourself in there. And that's what she's most afraid of, being alone with herself and finally looking into herself and seeing that there's nothing in there. She's totally empty and devoid of any real feeling. And she seems to know it. Fascinating part of the call. And the second most fascinating part of the call is Donna saying, reading out his reviews and saying, everybody online thought you were great and you nailed it. And Georgia Kappelman was terrible. So let's get into this call without further ado. An incarcerated individual at the Leon County Jail. This call is not private. It will be recorded and may be monitored. If you believe this should be a private call, please hang up and follow facility instructions to register this number as a private number. To accept charges and consent to this recorded call, press 1. To re Thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Hey, yeah, sorry about that. So now, last thing I heard was you said, and the chief, and then it, it just went through. Uh, he was supposed to buy He's the same guy who said he was in a call. Dan back when I first got here, and then we called him back. Mm. But Chief Mac, he's the chief of the whole jail, was to come by and check me out. Isn't that funny? That's Chief Mac. That is the man who testified in Donna's hearing. Little did Donna know that she would be facing Chief Mack and he would be answering for all her complaints of all her rights being violated in a really soft-spoken voice. But here's Charlie talking about the same Chief Mack. So he has, not, he has not been there yet? He has not, but the psychologist... PhD, yeah. whatever she is. Yeah. Uh, she came by and I said, listen, I'm fine. I just I'm getting caught in the like sure. I like, used to looking outside of a window, you know, inches out into the pod, and this is like a mirror. You're sitting in like a, a block. One yeah, like a same type style that I had before, but I could look out the window into the pod here and it's like a box. So you can't see, it's just a, it's a mirror, they can see in and you can't see out. Is it any help? Like, can, can Dan get this guy to come sooner? Is that the no, any help? God, she, no, God, she's back one of the fucking jail. Yeah, I don't care about what we're calling. No. Right, yeah. it'll come slower. Just a warning, I forgot to warn you that the language is really bad in this from Charlie. And I forgot to also show you a picture of Janice. Sometimes she's referred to as Dr. M, although she isn't a doctor of any sort. But she has that hard look in the face that so many of Charlie's women have. Yeah. I'm sure you I'm sure the psychologist thought you were fine, so it's just a matter of waiting for that and, and waiting for the chief. Yeah, she said she has a record for and then, you know, it's a new call, and then maybe tomorrow, yeah. Mm. I got 33% left on my phone, and then oh, well. it's in the afternoon. And, uh, it's okay, it won't hit the 15%, so you switch the little battery saver on, and then I can probably get back to 
it's like, you know, you're just isolating. Like, I'm used to being able to talk to yeah. people around. Yeah, of course. Chat at it's like, yeah. you're, you're doing the complete opposite of what I would need to have done to Right. In this situation. Right. Right. I know. But the, all right. It sounds like if it's not today, they'll do it tomorrow, you know, but hopefully today. But they're not yeah. in a rush, Travis. You know, you're in a rush, they're not in a rush. Uh, I just like, yeah, you know, just banging up all this happened, and now I'm like, take it out of my normal surroundings, and like, I know. put into, uh, put into, like, a solitary. Okay. I mean, I get why, too. But this is like, you know, it's, trust me, it's just a, a bed on, a, on like a plastic box. I, I rolled up my mattress upstairs and brought it down to here, and it's just my like bed sitting in my box. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm getting some complaints about. That's fine. That's that's fine. I know the video looks a little odd, but thank you to Charlie, uh, to Craig, Charlie. That's who I'm listening to. Craig underscore R. Please subscribe to his channel. He's got a. He just fixed the audio. Dan Markell's victim impact statement so you can hear really hear it and he improved the audio on this so thank you so much for doing that he also has a lot of other things he also fixed the audio in Dubin's Josh Dubin the jury the one million dollar jury consultant his voir dire so you can find that all that on his channel and more great videos there and it's the same story with like they'll shut off the phones at four and not till six thirty back on. Is that is that everywhere? Yeah. 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 And I'm just, oh, hold on. Just checking in. Okay. That's Bree just checking in with me. Okay. Um, I am. Uh, I talked to Eddie on the fan. Yeah. Then. Eddie's like, working hard. He's. He's still in Tallahassee. I thought he had left. He's staying here last few days. I guess to write up. Did you hear that? It sounded like Charlie was almost going to start like forcing a cry, and then Donna kind of echoes like the same kind of despair, and then he quickly pulls himself together, and he's like, "And Dan's working hard. I talked to Dan. Yeah, and he's working hard." <laughs> Charlie is also the master of trying to get people to feel sorry for him. I would call him master sympathy vampire. (laughs) And Donna plays right into it. They're just doing a little kitchen sink drama. They know what they've done. They know he was guilty. They knew what the case was against him. He put on two witnesses, himself and Wendy's divorce lawyer. Correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, please, if they put on someone else that I can't remember. Wasn't much of a defense. And Rashbaum's closing was way too long and scattered all over the place. It was like an hour too long. I think it went on for two and a half hours. I may be exaggerating in my memory of it. But it was ridiculously long. And according to the people who were in court, they said the jury was totally bored by the end. And when he made a joke about wrapping up, they all laughed nervously. But Dan is, Dan Rashbaum is intimately involved with his family. I mean, I don't know how I, I don't I I don't know how he can how he can represent these people or even put on that defense and live with himself, but okay. Sure, he's very rich from it. Yeah. 
whatever it is that they open up an inquiry to ask the judge. Okay, so good. They investigate the same line. You know, he said, look, it may be the kind of thing that yeah. nine months from now, a juror writes something stupid on a on a blog and they investigate and they find out, like, um, and they, they find out something and they're able to open up the open it and then it could possibly lead to an appeal, you know, I, I basically See, they have had their mindset on the jury from day one. And this makes my suspicion stronger that they, that, that what Sonny called Dr. Blood, who was so pro defense. And of course, people may have been some kind of Adelson plant because they had their mindset on the beginning that the jury was going to be the focus of their defense. And when people talk about that theory, they say, well, it couldn't have, he couldn't have been an Adelson plant. They couldn't have taken part in jury tampering because he was so obviously pro defense. If you were really in there, you wouldn't make it obvious. But I would argue that he wasn't paid if he was, say, this is a thought experiment and just a theory. Don't sue me, Dan Rashbaum. <laughs> he wasn't paid if he were paid in this thought experiment. He wouldn't be paid to do it well. That wouldn't assure, his payment would assure that he would do it well. It would just assure that he would be on team defense. And I, I can't, it's just hard for me to think of any other reason because it certainly wasn't in the evidence presented why anyone would would reject. Apparently was shaking his head when G Georgia spoke and nodding along with the defense. But maybe he's just one of, I mean, you meet these, I see these I've kind of pro-defense people in the comments, not on this case, but you meet them out there in the internet world, very pro-criminal, pro-defense people depending on the subject matter they're commenting on. The judge let a lot of stuff in to the case that he did that because he didn't want them to appeal. You know, right. you get it. You know the, the harder the judge rules, I guess there's more repellent issues that can come up. Like if that guy, uh, Hank, you know, Hankerson or whatever, you know, I guess the harder the judge rules, on issues that are in the trial, the more likely there's to have a felony issue. Here the judge is in the favor of the defendant, the more likely there's to have a felony issue. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I do. So, my general feeling, this is just my feeling, I'm not a lawyer, but right. my feeling is that he ruled, if, you know, if anything, he gave the, uh, us the benefit of the doubt because he didn't want there to be the felony. Yeah. Is that what Sandy like, thinks? Well, I mean, he, he... Not because he was, the judge was being fair because he was following the law. Or, I mean, you could even argue not because he's maybe a little bit of a pro-defense judge, a judge who often rules for the defense, that would kind of ruin, not kind of, would certainly ruin Charlie's narrative. It's got to be a big conspiracy. The judge did it because he didn't want an appeal. Yeah, of course you don't want an appeal. You don't want to go against the, if you have a successful appeal, it means that something went wrong, that the law wasn't followed in some way. But he's saying, that wasn't it. He wasn't following the law. He just didn't want me to get a second chance. That doesn't even make any sense, Charlie. He made that comment to me that he, he like, he, the judge ruled in our favor a number of times. You know, he let him bring stuff in. And I, I either said it or I heard it that he meant it, that there's not going to be, uh, you know, let things uh, say that we're not wrong. I mean, you have to either say that the judge did something. Then it gives you your your due process. 
You know, the jury didn't do anything improper. Thing improper, like, what's your reason for wanting a new trial? If, if there was an appeal, would it have to be in Tallahassee, or can you move it? Because they, I don't understand why they wouldn't let you move the venue. I don't. It was blatantly. Doesn't this, doesn't this sound like ground control to Major Charlie? Can you hear me, Charlie? Doesn't he sound like he's in outer space? <laughs> in that, because of course he's alone and he's on watch. <laughs> it's so absurd. But they had it. I mean, just to give you an idea of some of Josh Dubin's colleagues and contemporaries at the Innocence Project, let's talk about Jennifer Bonjean's a lawyer who got Bill Cosby's conviction overturned. She's currently representing R. Kelly. She's represented Keith Ranieri. I mean, the worst people, she's gotten some of the worst, most guilty murderers off in Chicago. I mean, these people happily represent and do it joyfully, overturning the worst people on planet Earth's convictions who are rightfully convicted. So just to give you a, a sense of who these people are behind this movement. I mean, look, I have, um, I didn't say this to you before I picked up the phone, but there's a lot of things that we have to do and we've got a very tight time frame. So one of them involves taking care of some things for Roman, taking care of some things through Steinberg. It was just, Dad's been on the phone all day and Susan was nice enough when I called her. She said, I'm going to gather everything up and I'm going to drive down. So she and Rick got here about, I don't know, 10 minutes before you, you called so that she could work with us because we got a couple of hours of stuff to take care of for Roman. So working on that and um, just a lot, just a lot, but it, you know, you're, you're going to be okay. You're going to get out of that, that stupid room. Once you do, you'll start to feel a little bit better. I know that. The room stupid. The people of Tallahassee, they say, one of these audio tapes were all stupid. Any smart person could see that Charlie was innocent. I mean, this is really what I've been saying since the beginning, a very cult-like family with an us versus them mentality. And anyone who's not on team innocence, they're against. There's a really interesting call where she's talking about Wendy and she reads a text message from Wendy and Wendy is like, stop texting me about the case. And Donna's like, what case? There is no case anymore. Talking about Charlie's case. Of course, Wendy's correct in seeing that all these things are connected. And Wendy's basically telling Donna, look, your code words aren't that good. And there's also other calls where Charlie's affirming that Donna picked the code word TV and that it was a code word. It's, it, they're, they're all so damning. And when I have something that I do need to tell you, I'll, you know, I'll speak to Dan. Okay. So then, and then I'll let you know what time to call him. Can you hear me, Charlie? Shit. You can't hear me again, right? Charlie. Charlie, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Isn't this like Doctor Who or something? Some sci-fi series? Charlie, Charlie, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, and not for nothing, but their mouth on this family, something. I'm sorry. The fourth time that they that they cut they cut the line each time. Cut the 
they pay for every minute, but they keep charging every time you reconnect. They say that doesn't happen. So someone cut the line. They, these horrible they people at the jail, the everybody holding Charlie hostage at the jail. It's nothing that they did to get themselves there. It's not that he had a, a multi-million dollar defense and he lost. He gambled and he lost. No, it's everybody conspiring. So here are the things that they blame it on. They blame it on the jury. They blame it on Georgia Kappelman wanting to make her career on this case. He calls it the Super Bowl of Tallahassee. The city of Tallahassee, they blame it on. They blame it on media attention, very much like Dr. Sam Shepard. That's how he got his conviction overturned with the help of F. Lee Bailey, O.J. Simpson, one of O.J. Simpson's attorneys. And finally, they blame it on Wendy. But someone is cutting the line, not the call dropped. And what she's concerned with is the price of these calls, that the call dropped and she has to pay to reconnect. Not like I'm lucky to be able to talk to my son day or night whenever I, I want, thanks to this new tablet policy. So after or during the pandemic, and I think they've just extended this policy because they've seen how well it works and how it keeps everybody sort of happy and connected in jail. They've given people in jail tablets and they're allowed to make these calls whenever they want. But somebody, somebody, guys, somebody, somebody just like, they, they cut the line. <laughs> they cut the line. They don't want them communicating. It's all a big conspiracy. <laughs> it's that he's in this room that they have a movie. So the psychologist, they want to make sure he doesn't kill himself. So the psychologist finally came. And he said to her, if you leave me here, I'll kill myself. There's no, no light, no nothing. I'm in a cement block. Let me go back to myself and see where I am. Nobody, you know, Please don't leave me here. And spoke to him for a little bit. She says, no, you're, you're perfectly fine. I know that. I just have to go back and, you know, I've got a few of these reports I have to write. Once I get those written and then submit them and then get them approved, you'll be able to go back. So he thought he was going back like yeah. in an hour. But said, she better get that thing done because I'll lose my mind in here. It's all... It's this old spirit on the inside. The so all you see is yourself. The lights never shut off. It's all spirit in the inside. All you see is yourself. And this is what I was referring to earlier on the top of the show. This is Donna's fear. She knows that there's nothing inside her. Biggest fear is looking into that chasm and seeing that she doesn't have a soul, there is no soul, there's nothing. This is a family whose values have been money, getting over on everybody else, getting what they can, getting the most and giving as little as possible would be a short way to put it. And revenge. Those are the things that they love and the high life, living the high life, money and things. There's no real soul, none of the things that mattered. And this is why I think Dan Markell bothered them so much. Is because he had real values and a real sense of spirituality and love. And they have none of that. So this is her biggest fear, to be left alone. Little did she know that when she was boarding that flight to Vietnam, that she would end up in exactly the same position. Her fear would come true. Day or night, these fluorescent lights, she says, well, all night. She said, I just want to go back where I was. At least I know people. I can see people. He says, here, I'm in a box. So he's just... She's just... What? I mean, I'm sure he'll pull back or just keep getting disconnected. I
know how he is a year ahead. His body and everything just slowly started to deteriorate. I'm old. I have a life. We had a great marriage. Happy. We traveled. We lived good. I was really not unhappy. And I wasn't willing to just say goodbye. I let me lie down. It was really nice. It wasn't painful. I just want to go to sleep. We bought our cemetery property a couple months ago. We're good. I'm good. Right. So she's lived a good life. She's not unhappy. Boy, there's an admission in the negative. Another call, she said that Dan Markell is haunting her from the grave. I mean, it's really like reached operatic Shakespearean heights, this story. I mean, wouldn't this make a good opera? She's, now she realizes she's, reaffirming her choices that she's made. We lived well. Yeah, of course you lived well. That was the sole focus of your life is getting as much money as you could in whatever way that you could. In my opinion, moral or not, breaking the law or not, that's just my take. And now you know that you're going to need something else. You're going to need something else to get you through. So you, the better choice is to just end it all. So I don't know if this is for, this is of course when she thinks the call has dropped and no one is listening, but you can hear my point was, was you can hear someone in the back, which I think either they're doing a three-way call or someone else is over Maybe it's Charlie's baby mama. I'm not sure. There's someone in the back of this call that she's talking to. Some of these sentences don't make sense. Just directed to Harvey. So that was my dissatisfaction with that answer. To answer some of the questions in the comments about it. I went into this weekend because I had I said something that made her feel like I... I had enough, and I'm not going to watch. If the trial doesn't go well, I know what I need to do. Now, you know something is wrong because he lived here nine years. She's never once just come over and said, I need to talk to you. So she's talking about Wendy. This, of course, is on the day of Charlie's conviction. The next day, they bought their tickets, one-way ticket to Vietnam via Dubai. And you can hear, I don't think it's in this call, maybe it is, Donna talking about Rashbaum advising them that they may get caught. They may not make it. She sat down on the couch right there. I was sitting here, and she didn't say, Mom, this is a horrible time for all of us. Charlie's on trial for his life. We're all aggravated. But if this is what you're thinking, oh, just sat there. Do I want to go to sleep and not see my son? I do. Perfectly honest, I do. And we'll do it together. We'll do it together. Leave a note. They'll know when to come in there. And we'll do it together. decision at some point. So after speaking to Dan this morning and knowing what they're thinking up there, I don't know if we'll make it out in time. I really don't. But Dan said, you might, or you might do all of it, get to the airport, and they'll stop us. And that could happen. It could happen. I don't know. Well, you know, they didn't stop us. They stopped you, Donna, you and you alone. Harvey walked out a free man for now. 
but you can hear the anxiety. Their world has narrowed. And there's an, another call where she says, maybe this is this call. Maybe I'm thinking of this call where she says, Wendy could talk to us as a lawyer. She could advise us on non-extradition countries as a lawyer who doesn't talk, who doesn't talk. So now the world has been divided in those who talk, those who could implicate them, and those that don't talk. And the only safe people are the ones that don't talk. It's a world of absolute paranoia and secrecy, which I had picked up on before in her, in her filing from jail. She still has that paranoid mindset. The whole world is against them. The only people they can trust are her co-conspirators, in my opinion, and her lawyer, the great Danny Rashbaum. I mean, she thinks everything he does is wonderful. It's like, like the like a cartoon version of a Jewish mama and her son. The great Dan Rashbaum can do no wrong, but Wendy has fallen out of favor, and you can hear them in other calls really blaming Wendy and Wendy's driving by the crime scene. There's a whole call about that, Wendy buying bullet bourbon, as they're saying it was all a coincidence. And that Georgia Kappelman dumbed down coincidences. That's what Charlie says in one of these calls. How do you do that for the jury? She dumbed down all these coincidences. If it's a coincidence, then it's a coincidence. That's the end of the explanation. You would say she gave all these wrong explanations for what was a coincidence. You can't dumb it down. <laughs> That's there's no there's no other ex, there's no larger explanation than it was a coincidence, right? She gave alternative reasons, right? Not not a bright guy, this Charlie. But it's worth a try. <laughs> I tried and tried and tried. I don't know what I'm doing. I've just I've lost it, but I don't know what I'm doing. And and we we have to do that stuff for women. What was the sensation? How is it more than one? With with stipulations as to who's in charge and. So who is that woman? That doesn't sound like Donna to me. So either they're making what they shouldn't make, which is three party calls, or they have someone over there. But Wendy is the smartest in the whole family, maybe because she's a lawyer. And she's like, Mom, your code words are easily understood on these text messages. And even though you want me to come over and give you advice, business advice, everybody knows what that is. Charlie, he's worried about you. He wants to know what, oh, because I said, yeah, 
you never, we know you never ask anything about your brother, and she doesn't, and she told me it's because her lawyer said she shouldn't ask. And but we, that, we found out it's not true. But we true. just got off the phone my, with him. My attorney, and he asked her attorney. Her attorney said, I never told her that. But I've never confronted them. I uh, know. Isn't that funny? They're all upset because Wendy gave the excuse that my attorney told me not to ask my family about my brother on trial. And the and then they asked the attorney, they're like, we never, I never gave Wendy that advice. So this is a family that constantly lies to the, <laughs> to the other people in the family and to everyone else. And now they're getting offended because their daughter is lying to them. And a family who's always looked after their own interest, put themselves first every single time, is now upset because Wendy, product of their rearing, puts herself first. And I don't feel bad for this family. I feel bad for the Markells. My sympathy is entirely towards the Markell family and Wendy's children. They were the ones playing God. You know why people love the Sopranos and Goodfellas and the Godfather? Because it's a fantasy. It's a fantasy of being God and that people would be so afraid of you that you would get your way every single time. You'd get the tables you'd want. You get treated like a queen or a king everywhere you go. And you'd have everything you wanted out of life just for the asking. Because as adults, we know that we aren't God and we can only control what we do, not what others do. And that there's a lot of irrational, crazy people out there and we have to deal with them. And sometimes we're at their mercy and sometimes we're at institutions' mercy, for example, in jail. But this family acts like they are a mafia family. And that they that they are entitled to get their way every single time, and that they can ex extinguish a life of an extraordinary person just because he's in their way, and he's not bending to their will, and he won't be bullied. So I wrote this last night. We know you never ask anything about your brother. This is eight o'clock last night, but we just got off the phone with him, and the first thing he asked was, "How's Wendy holding up?" I didn't have the heart to tell him that you never called us or asked about him. I just said, we weren't up to phone calls right now. Everyone looks to protect you. I bet you've got a lot to think about. But then she didn't answer. But then I got another call from Charlie. And I said, just got off the phone with Charlie. He's worried about you. He wants to know why we didn't speak. I told him a lie. I said, we're only speaking with you and Dan right now. I couldn't bear to tell him the truth. Your sister never even called us, is the truth. So she says this morning, I thought she'd be racing over here last night. Yeah. Dear mom, I know you are upset by the verdict, but the anger directed at me is not justified. I don't know how much. This text message is so Wendy. It's so the epitome of Wendy. I know you're angry at me, but. You have no reason to be angry at me. I'm going to deny what we all know to be true, blatantly and in your face. Because it serves me well at the moment. Anger. We don't. I'm not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong, and I was not involved in any way with Danny's death. When I was interviewed by the police and testified in court, I told the truth as I was required to do. I cannot control how the prosecutor used my statement to Charlie's trial. Again, I didn't say that. Also, as you know, my, I do know, my lawyer has advised me not to talk to my family or anyone else about this case. No, about the case, which is true, we've never done it. I followed his advice despite your disagreements with this guidance. Please do not text me about this case anymore. Not about the case, is it? Not what I said about her brother, and that he wants, how are you, Wendy? How's my sister holding up? Yeah, mm -hmm. 
If you have anything further to say about the case, please go through our lawyers. Right now, I have to be singularly focused on taking care of the boys during this difficult time. So I wrote back, okay, we have no desire to speak with you about the case. I guess Dad and I are just shocked that you didn't think of coming to see us or even calling us. We are your parents. We are and have always been there for you and the boys. None of what we wrote matters about the case. That's over. I just want you to know how many times Charlie is asking about you. Not only do you not ask about us, but not one question about Charlie, right? We will need to give you some information shortly, and we need some business assistance. Please let us know if you can be of any help. I have a space here. I want to give her codes. We're going to be gone. I want her to have all this information. I have the, I have the cemetery property. I want her to see all that. I want her to have all these papers and the wills. I want her to see all this. So, so I wouldn't be surprised if Wendy has been demoted in the will, her chunk lessened, or if not completely cut out. They seem to have also convinced themselves that the root of all their troubles is Wendy, and it may be, but my point, if you listen to at the top of the show, is that everybody had their own reasons, in my opinion, for participating in this. Because I don't believe that this family operates in a way of doing for <laughs> doing for others, even Charlie. They are a family of self-interested, narcissistic, antisocial personality, psychopath, whatever you want to call it, sociopathic people. There is no fa familiar love, familiar care. Even in this way, everyone did participated for their own reasons. That's my theory on it. You can let me know whether you think I'm far off or right on or close. Please let us know if you can be of any help. The other thing is the visa, which she would know about. The no, I said we need, we need some business assistance. Please let us know. If, if not, we'll try to find someone who can help us. This needs an immediate reply so I can start asking other people to help. And then she always gets nervous if we want to talk to her. So I wrote, don't get nervous. Again, nothing, in capital letters, nothing about the case. Just would like to show you some business stuff and personal things. If you Donna is the queen of emissions in the negative. So when Charlie, after the bump, asked, is it, is it about Wendy? She's like, Society Page did a great video on this. She's like, no, 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 no. Anything that Donna denies emphatically or talks about in the negative, just consider an admission in the negative. Yes, this is about the case. They're worried that one or both of them are going to be next, arrested next and that they're either fleeing or doing something else. Both things they've talked about with Rashbaum. He's fully aware, and they have prepared the their affairs. They had their affairs prepared a year before. They didn't get them in order. They had all this stuff done about a year before. But she wants Wendy to see all these things like it's a big middle finger. That's all I can say. Yeah, that's the best way I can put it to her. I want her to see all this. And I would think that if she chose the other plan to end it all, that her fantasy, though I don't believe Donna or Harvey could ever go through with it. I think they're too narcissistic. Although sometimes these narcissists can surprise you and it's about control and when they fear losing control and this is a family so much about control i think though that 
you know, we know now what they chose, which was the other plan to go to Vietnam. I think that she, her fantasy was that Wendy would be really hurt and maybe feel guilty about it because they all did it for her. LOL. You can't do it. We must find someone who can. I hope you understand that it has nothing to do with the case. There is no more case. And then I wrote, by the way, you said you have to focus on the boys. Have you told them? So when I got George before, I said to him, he says, I was over there last night. I said, well, I asked Wendy, but I haven't gotten any word from her. So did she tell the boys? And he said, she did. Now, I know Ben was very close. He was writing to Charlie all the time. So I said, how are they? Ben was very quiet. He didn't really talk much. He says, Lincoln kind of faced it and said, so he's never coming home. And he said, he's never coming back. And so he said, it took him 10 minutes and he was in Sebastopol. I said, fine. He's a child. That's okay. I don't want, I don't want to see them miserable and upset. That's not my goal. I just want to know how are they. So that's what I said earlier to George, because it was technical stuff that I couldn't do on the computer. I think just because we were out of it. So and he's a computer tech person. Does anyone know who this George person is that they keep referring to? So I've heard Rebecca referred to. There seems to be a woman in the back. I don't know if that is the the Rebecca that they're talking to. But who is this George that they're running this all by? I assume he's a lawyer in this case, someone's lawyer, because it seems like their world has been narrowed to a few friends. What I mean by they is Donna, Harvey, Charlie, and Wendy. Few friends and mostly communicating through lawyers because they don't talk. We need someone who doesn't talk. And you have to hear the desperate way that Donna says that. Wendy could Wendy could advise us as a lawyer who doesn't who doesn't talk. I mean, it's just so over the top delivery. Her anxiety is at eleven for all you spinal tap fans out there. So I said, Can you help me with some computer stuff that I, I can't get done? And he was on some business calls so that he texted me just before I can be there, maybe 5, 5.30, would that be good? I said, yes, but if I can get the stuff done, then it's no. I, I told you I have the space in the passport. We have the photos. Sure. Sure. We have to get them downloaded. And the other thing I don't understand that my daughter could help me with, but we've been looking it up over and over because things change if there is extradition from Vietnam. Because we, we've looked at all the places. I mean, I could go to Korea and China, but there's no extradition. But we're looking for places where there's no extradition. Who? Oh, really? Good. Maybe she knows about Maybe she can look up the extradition issue yeah. before we waste, waste our time. She can tell on you that my parents are thinking of leaving the country. My lawyer told us to do that. Okay, but if you mention it to Wendy, is Wendy going to tell somebody? Well, you, you tell her beforehand. I need to tell you something. As so there, did you guys hear that? So there's that woman in the back. And thank you to everybody who informed me that George is Wendy's boyfriend. So there's that woman in the back saying, is Wendy going to tell? And Harvey saying, no, I don't think Wendy would tell. But our lawyer knows, meaning Dan Rashbaum knows that we are planning on fleeing. As an attorney who doesn't doesn't talk and has nothing to do with the case, it just has to do with mom and I and some decisions that we have to make. Yeah, uh, yeah I know you. There it is. As a lawyer who doesn't talk, the best kind of person, the kind of person who doesn't talk. So hysterical, the delivery, I can't get over it. I want to bring her up and show her where everything is. It's a plane crash, no one's going to know where anything is or who belongs to what. So I would like her to come up here so she could see it. 
I don't think that's asking too much. She can live three hours away. Every time she says, can you do this? Can you come here? Can you do this? Everything. How many times do we have plans that I really can't and have to cancel? Wendy needs us for this. Wendy needs us to babysit. So we've been really good nannies, and I oh, guess yeah. our, our job is up. Because now the boys are older, they can go out with friends, they can do things on their own. That's the other thing. So Donna is finally coming to the realization that Wendy has used her the way Donna has taught her to use everyone in her life. She forgot to teach her, not the people in this family. And Charlie and Donna and Harvey haven't woken up to the fact that Dan Rashbaum hyped them up, sold them a bag of goods, sold them a million dollar snake oil salesman in the form of a jury consultant. Hype them up, just like I said he was doing. How did I know that Dan Rashbaum was hyping Charlie up and telling him the case was going to go great and they were going to win? And that he was innocent. And you can hear Charlie repeating all the kind of points that Josh Dubin talked about in his voir dire. Oh, we had too many law people with families and law enforcement. We had too many, too many biased people. We didn't have an entire jury of team criminal, team innocence. Poor us. So she doesn't need grandma and grandpa. Okay. Pretty hurtful. That's one son that I don't speak with. I have one son who's close to being dead. And my daughter, whom I love, is doing this. I don't get it. I don't get it. I said to Harvey, I swear to God, our family was cursed. Absolutely cursed. And I don't know how to take care of it anymore. I mean, this is really like crime and punishment. When you dis- decide to take a person's life and play God, things don't go so well sometimes for you if you're looking to get away with it and live happily, a happy, peaceful life without worrying about the police arresting you at any moment and getting caught and losing everything. I mean, this is, I mean, it's like, it's unbelievable the things, I mean, Donna impresses me as very in touch with herself and the situation. She knows, she knows she's living in hell, basically. This is hell for her. And it's a hell that they made. But it's nothing compared to the life sentence of grief that they sentenced the Markell family to. So, Charlie, you know, I
So that was the call. I'm going to take a quickie little break. When we get back from the break, Phil Markell's victim impact statement. I'm going to take a listen to that. Craig underscore R's channel. Great channel. Highly recommend you subscribe. Has cleaned up the audio on that. We're going to take a listen to the whole thing. Just as a reminder of who who sympathy we should have in this story. I'll meet you on the other side of the break. Don't go anywhere. If you are enjoying this episode of My True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Okay. So this was, I found really moving. Phil Markell's victim impact statement at Charlie Adelson's sentencing. And many people said they couldn't hear it. Craig underscore R's channel has uploaded it, really worked on the audio. He's worked on the even the subtitles and thought we'd take a listen to it together. Good morning. At this time, we're going to start with the big impact statements. Mr. Markell, I understand you're going to have to divide it instead of half of the family. Yes, thank you. By the way, all the links to the videos that I used in this episode are in the episode description. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Phil Markell. I am Dan Markell's father. Dan, my only son, was born October 9, 1972 in Montreal, Quebec. During that time in Quebec, husbands were not allowed to actually be in the delivery room during a child's birth. However, since the obstetrician was a very close friend of ours, I was allowed to experience the most amazing of moments, the birth of my son. I will never forget the emergence of his head and then those shoulders of an NFL football fullback, a boy of 10 pounds. There I was, holding in my arms, this gift of life, my bundle of absolute sheer joy. From the time he was a child, my son had tremendous energy, intelligence, and great warmth. Dan had a vibrant, fun-loving personality and lived life to its fullest. Danny loved to socialize, dance, cook, entertain, and play sports, and dedicated himself wholeheartedly to everything that he did. He always looked to do his utmost to improve and achieve better results in every activity that he did. This desire of improvement and commitment to excellence was a defining characteristic of his short life. 
I fondly remember taking Danny skiing up the hill to the Laurentian Mountains in Quebec when he was just two years old. He rode up the mountain between my legs, holding on to the T-bar, T-bar, and then coming down the ski hill, yelling with great joy, faster, Daddy, faster. Then, as he grew a little older, he played hockey at the local park. To improve his skating skill, he requested to take a speed skating lesson with a local coach who was from Russia, and he had a very uh, a reputation of being a very tough coach. Dan persevered, and after every hockey lesson, he came off the ice with a red face, totally out of breath, because he always gave it his all. At about the age of 13, Danny developed the idea that he was going to Harvard University for his college education. He discovered that the acceptance requirements for Harvard were not only good grades, but also work for the community and charitable work. To achieve these goals, he revived his high school newspaper. He became the newspaper's editor, the business manager, and performed charitable deeds and volunteered in the community. After years of hard work and determination, Dan was accepted to Harvard. He graduated from Harvard Magna Cum Laude, went on to study at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem for one year, and then earned a Master's of Philosophy and Political Theory from Emmanuel College at the University of Cambridge in England. He returned thereafter to Harvard Law School to earn his law degree and went on to become an extremely successful lawyer, influential legal scholar. Dan served as a law clerk for a federal judge, worked as an associate of the prestigious law firm in Washington, D.C., and then secured a prestigious teaching position at FSU College of Law. In a few short years, Dan became a full tenured law professor before the tender age of 41, quite unusual. Dan co-authored a book and published many articles in highly regarded law journals and newspapers like the New York Times. Dan's work was influential, and he gave lectures and presented at universities around the world. Although Dan was fond of his Canadian roots, he was very dedicated to the FSU Law School and the Tallahassee community. He was recognized as a scholar who contributed and made a difference in the world. While Dan's career was important to him, family meant everything to Dan. Danny's marriage produced two boys, Benjamin and Lincoln, who were his absolute world and the love thing to him. Dan made sure that he and the boys kicked the monkey thing to him. Dan made sure that he and the boys kicked the Montreal and Toronto to attend every family affair and visit with all the extended Markel family, including grandparents, uncles, aunts and many numerous cousins. Despite the distance, <clears throat> Dan felt that the boys had to know and be a part of the family. Dan also made sure that he and the boys participated in the Tallahassee community and they were involved in the local synagogue and neighborhood. Dan left home at the young age of 17 to go to Harvard. But he always came home for summer vacations, holidays, and all family functions. Danny and I, despite the fact that we lived quite far apart, regularly communicated by text, email, and phone calls. Despite the physical distance, as time moved on, we grew ever so much closer. As Dan suggested, we would plan to talk and have a meal together. At the appointed day and time, we each would prepare our meals, set our tables with a tablet in the middle, and over Skype, Skype we would sit together and enjoy each other's company for a couple of hours despite the actual distance. That I found so touching, that they would talk over Skype, they would have dinner over Skype and set the table like they were together. It's, it's just it's just so sad and so 
to watch Charlie Adelson's face, and I'm sure the Adelson family has convinced themselves they never talk about Dan Markell or the Markell family in all the audio tapes that I've heard, to have his face listening to it, I'm sure he's convinced himself that he did something good taking part in this. It's, it's just awful. The whole thing. What horrible people. That's, I mean, that's just solidified of anything that it's audio files solidified in me is that this family is the most soulless, moralless, reprehensible family, hateable family that I've come across in a long time. Dan's life was abruptly cut short and he was forever taken from me. His boys and the rest of our family and all his many friends and colleagues my life has been a total disarray since Sam's murder. <clears throat> Many nights I wake up in the middle of the night in a terrible sweat with thoughts of Dan's murder and all that has happened. There is not a single day in my life since Danny's death that in one way or another, he does not enter into my thoughts. And I miss him with all my heart. I'm constantly reminded of Dan's murder and his absence. When I meet new people, the topic of discussion always comes up when they ask whether I have children. How do I respond? It is difficult to put into words the heinous acts that took Danny away from us. The unthinkable pain that I must live with every single day. Losing a son or a daughter is something I wish nobody, nobody should have to experience. It's not in the order of nature. <clears throat> Danny is never coming back. We continue to hope and pray for justice and the return to normality of seeing and playing a vital role in the lives of our two grandsons, Ben and Link. It has been a number of years since I last wrote a piece of impact statement, sharing how Danny's death has affected me. Despite our persistent efforts, we still do not have a real relationship with Danny's son, Ben and Lincoln. Visits are limited and very controlled. For six years, we were denied any and all visits with the boys. In the last two years, I've been permitted two 60 to 90 minute visits, supervised visits. This limited contact is incredibly painful. And I feel like we have cut out of our lives. Not only have I lost my son, <clears throat> but I have effectively lost two of my grandkids as well. Even their family names have been changed from Markel to Abel. And that's something I'm so glad that he talked about in this victim impact statement, that these children don't even have their name anymore. She's taken, she's removed every single part of the Markell family and er tried to totally erase Dan Markell's legacy, but has been unsuccessful being the remarkable person that he was. He still takes center stage in the story. While we work hard to help introduce a new bill in the state of Florida known as the Markell Act, which gives grandparents important rights, unfortunately, our relationship with Ben and Lincoln has, been, has not been materially improved. As this bill was coming to fruition, there was a lot of negative publicity in the press and media about Daddy's ex wife, Wendy. In my opinion, Wendy was focused on improving her public image and as a result extended an invitation to us to Ben's bar mitzvah. Ruth and I were invited to attend only the ceremonial part of this important stage in the Jewish boy's life. 
and we were not invited to participate in any reception typical of this celebration. But this invitation opened the door to one of the limited visits described above. In order not to not overwhelm Ben and Lincoln on this important day, we asked, we asked to arrange a meeting before the Bandit in order to make things easier on the boys, who we hadn't been allowed to visit in years. We were able to arrange a brief 90 minute supervised visit with Ben and Lincoln and a few weeks before this was a few weeks before the bar mitzvah. However, <clears throat> immediately after our brief visit, Charlie was arrested, and Wendy extended our invitation to the bar mitzvah. At the time, she said that they were going to either postpone or completely cancel this bar mitzvah ceremony. Neither of those happened. That is so Wendy. So. Charlie's been arrested, and that gives her the opportunity to say, oh, we've canceled the part of the bar mitzvah because of family crisis. So the one time she could extend common courtesy and civility to the Markell family and endure a little bit of discomfort, she chooses to be completely cruel, cut them off, and lie to them. This is family. They just lie to each other all the time. They're just a bunch of liars. And then they the best part was Donna complaining that Wendy's lying to her. Lie to the Markells and say, oh, no, the whole thing's been canceled. Like they wouldn't figure out that that was a lie. They wouldn't catch wind of that. Unbelievable. Instead, my understanding is that the Adelsons went on to have the bar mitzvah ceremony and party, all without the Markel family's presence or participation. Missing out on this important moment in Ben's life was incredibly painful. After so many years without them, we had hoped to make progress in forging a consistent relationship with his son in this important life cycle event. Dan's murder brought his life abruptly to an end for no sensible reason and has affected a countless number of people. The legal community is deprived of Dan's wisdom and ideas, which made the world a better place. Dan's students are deprived of the experience of having Dan as a brilliant professor and caring mentor, showing them a path. Dan's colleagues can no longer benefit from Dan's friendship, insights, and scholarly, scholarly discussions and debates. Ruth and I have been deprived of our son, who has been taken away from us so suddenly and totally against life's schedule. Ben and Lincoln must go through life without their father, who loved them with all his deeds. The boys have been deprived of their father's entire family after Ben's murder. We have no idea of what these two boys know or have been told about Danny's death. They truly believe, I truly believe that they have been brainwashed in all these years, from the ages of three and four years of age to the present day. I also have no idea what the boys know of us, the entire Markel family, our history, etc., and especially <clears throat> how much we all love them and how we wish they were at this part of our family. Both groups, <clears throat> sorry. Both Ruth and I are approaching 80 years of age. At this moment, we are healthy, but one does not know what tomorrow brings. The wheels of justice turn very, very slowly, but so far we're very grateful that they're still turning. 
We're very grateful to Tallahassee Law Enforcement, to the state attorney, and all their staff, to all our relatives and friends, including the hundreds of Danish friends and colleagues around the world, for their constant support over these long 10 years. To all the podcasters who work hard to keep alive this unbelievable story. <clears throat> we are still waiting for Benjamin and Lincoln to have a more normal relationship with the Martell family as we wait in pain and anguish. The Adelson family, in particular Charlie Adelson, has been a major cause of our heartbreak and the murder of our son Danny and the loss of our two grandsons. <clears throat> I have suffered tremendously, and we as a family continue to suffer. It is satisfying to see justice being done, and it would be appropriate to ask for the maximum sentence for the perpetrators of Danny's murder. Thank you. Today is a good day. Okay. And you can see Charlie Adelson shaking his head no when he says Charlie Adelson is responsible for Dan, Danny's murder. A little bit of play acting there for Charlie Adelson. I've seen comments. And thank you so much, Jay Cash, for the super sticker. I appreciate it. I've seen comments that say, I think that the Adelsons have all convinced themselves or Charlie has convinced himself. Either way, Donna, Charlie, Wendy, Harvey, everyone but Harvey has convinced themselves that they weren't a part of this. And I have to disagree with that respectfully. I think they all know what they've done. They're well aware. I think that Charlie has been given the script of the talking points that he can make, that it was unfair that the prosecutor was out to make her name, et cetera, et cetera, that the people of Tallahassee were all out against out against him because it was such a high profile trial. But for those of us who watched the trial, it's pretty much done by the letter. He got a better, well money defense. I don't know what you want to say about Rashbaum as a lawyer, but he got a better defense than most Americans can afford. Certainly more money thrown into it. And he has no one to blame but himself. So save me the hysterics. I don't mean to be cold, but my sympathy is really with the Markell family. And had the Adelson family not chosen to play God and, and exact revenge in the way that they are one to do in that family, this would have never happened. They wouldn't have been, they wouldn't be in this position. But boy, what a world of paranoia. And I'd like to know where Donna got all those positive comments about Charlie Adelson's testimony from. Where is she hearing that? Because I was mostly on the Tallahassee Democrat chat. And pretty much 99 point or let's say 95 percent of the people were saying he was going to be convicted and about maybe 5 percent were saying he's going to hang. No one thought he was going to be acquitted. And I don't think it's a great move on Rashbaum's part to hype it up and tell him he was going home and everything was going great. One thing that Charlie Adelson will talk about it more tomorrow, really honed in on is George's clothes. He's really upset about George's closing argument and the slides, particularly the autopsy photo probably because that was uncomfortable for him to look at. And he knows the emotional impact. And much of the 
pro-criminal movement has tried to pass laws to ban autopsy photos in, in sentencing hearings, I believe. I don't know if it's closing arguments. My memory is sentencing hearings. So take that with a grain of salt. That's just my memory of it. But he's really mad about the slides behind Georgia. He knows the impact of that closing statement. But Donna and Charlie are in La La Land if they think the trial was going well. They say Georgia was finished on Friday before the close. Finished after Charlie's amazing time on the stand, including cross-examination. What a fantasy world they all are living in. And what a gift these audio files are. And boy, do they solidify what most of us were thinking about them as people and what they were experiencing and thinking and planning and how they worked. So join me tomorrow. I'm going to close this up for tonight. I'll be back tomorrow to talk more about these audio files. Thank you to Pretty Lies and Alibis, Gigi. You did a great job with the audio. Thank you for putting these up, for working so hard to clean them up. There are some really pretty incredible. I don't remember another case with jailhouse calls like this. If you think of a similar case, let me know in the comment section. Until then, have a great night. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Night, everybody.